Uh, well, thank you so much for having me um, and for giving me a chance to give this talk in front of such a distinguished audience. Um, I'm really happy to be able to give this talk and I'm just sorry I wasn't able to be there in person. Um, so today I'm going to talk about how our group propagates uh, maximally localized Wanier functions in real-time TDDFT. I'll talk a little bit about how we develop that uh, propagation method, and then I'll talk about kind of what we've done with it, how that inspired um, us to formulate and use these Wanier functions to accelerate hybrid functionals, and what we've done so far with the acceleration method and some results from that. So um, for our group, we do all our work in the cue ball code. So our implementation of maximally localized Wanye functions is based on the work done by Francois Gigi and collaborators in the cue box code, where they use the um, sine cosine method to uh, maximally localize the cone sham uh, single particle orbitals. Um, and in their work, they had only done this for real wave functions, but they had discussed being able to extend it for complex wave functions, which is what we have done. Um, and so in the cue ball code, we now propagate these complex uh, wave functions. And it's a two-step process where we essentially propagate the wave function at every step and then localize it at every step. And this method of localization is found to be very robust as uh, for a 64 atom cell of crystalline silicon we essentially see no drop off in the energy drift switching from um, the time dependent cone sham equations to the time dependent Wannier function equations. And also, I think very importantly, we see going to the maximum localized Wannier functions uh, only increases the cost of our calculations by about two times. And that's for a 512 atom uh, crystalline silicon cell. So originally, we implemented Wanye functions to be able to apply a spatially homogeneous electric field to our calculations under periodic boundary conditions. Um, and I will say, although this is not formally allowed in the theory, it has been shown that real-time TDDFT can give very accurate results um, when you apply the spatially homogeneous electric field to study different physical properties. So there are essentially two ways to do this. One is to use the velocity gauge and a vector potential. But since our code is a plane wave pseudo potential based code, um, implementing the external potential, which is non-local is very difficult. So instead we use the length gauge um, and then using the Wanye functions to be able to implement a scalar potential where we can essentially apply a identical electric field to every Wanye function in the simulation cell since the tails decay very rapidly um, as long as they're highly localized. And that way we can simulate the spatially homogeneous electric field. And so I know, um, I'm sure everyone here knows uh, all of these equations, but the idea was to be able to get the dynamic polarization, uh, essentially based on the modern theory of polarization from the Wanye centers. And with the dynamic polarization to be able to calculate the conductivity and then in turn the dielectric function or the dipole strength function to be able to um, get absorption spectra for different systems. And most of the work I'll talk about here and the results will be absorption spectra using this method. So one of the first uh, kind of molecular systems we looked at was benzene. Um, so comparing it to experiment, we are able to capture nearly exactly the main peak around six and a half EV um, for benzene. So the results initially were very promising uh, using the LDA exchange correlation functional. Um, and since we had the implementation of Wanye functions, we decided to look at this more complex system. Uh, here, a benzene in water in two different orientations for the pi electrons. And by using Wanye functions, we're able to decompose the spectra into the contributions from benzene versus the contributions from water. So here I'm showing the absorption spectra contributions from benzene only, and here we're able to observe changes in the low energy region um, in water versus vacuum. So these are some small scale systems, but our implementation is highly parallel and it's been shown to be very efficient. So we uh, decided to study solivated DNA with about 12,000 electrons. And for a system like this, the only way we can get really any insight is to be able to use um, Wanye functions. 
where here I've shown the essentially the DNA 1A functions are in blue and magenta and the water 1A functions are in cyan. Um, and so here the blue path is going straight through a projectile moving straight through the DNA and the red path is a projectile moving along the side path of DNA. Um, this way we can understand the effect of proton radiation on solvated DNA. And so here I just have a little movie uh, showing the changes in spread and displacement of the 1A centers as a proton moves through the center. Um, so size changes and color changes correspond to changes in spread and any movement corresponds to displacement. Um, and so why use 1A functions here at all? Well, using 1A functions, we can essentially break down the contributions from water um, and DNA and doing this and looking at one of the key properties uh, here, electronic stopping power or the change in energy with respect to change in position of the projectile, we can separate out contributions to the stopping power from the DNA strand or the red path first the DNA base, the blue path, and compare that to the stopping power for a proton in liquid water, which is what's commonly used for cancer research. So our results have shown that when the projectile is moving along the side path, there's a significantly larger energy transfer to the DNA as opposed to when it's moving through the center. Um, and so even beyond that, we, we explored exactly what is taking place um, at the molecular level using 1A functions. So looking at the displacement, we see that for the side path, there's a slightly larger change in displacement for one representative velocity. Um, and where shaded regions correspond to sugar phosphate side chain 1A function centers. And as expected, since the projectile, as it moves along the side path or the strand path is much closer to those, we see a much larger contribution to the displacement from those side chain 1A centers. And we did the same similar breakdown for spread change to get a measure of electron delocalization and the same story. Um, so that was a lot of our original work. But everything I've shown so far is based on using a GGA or an LDA exchange correlation potential. And in real-time PDDFT, there is a very large dependence on the results on which exchange correlation potential uh, we use. So just to give an example, crystalline silicon uh, with 512 electrons, 128 atoms. If you use LDA or GGA to get the absorption spectra, you get one story. If we go up one rung on the Jacobs ladder for DFT and we use a meta GGA and incorporate the kinetic energy density, we get a different picture of the absorption spectra. And if we go beyond that using hybrid functionals, um, we get a different picture again. However, using hybrid functionals in real time PDDFT is very costly due to this exchange integral I've shown at the top here, where we need to calculate the um, this exchange for every electron pair within the system. And so even for a 512, um, 128 atom system of silicon, this is very costly. However, um, this simulation cell is not still not converged with respect to cell size. So to use hybrid um, at the gamma point and to get a converged simulation cell, um, just using LDA, we have to go all the way to 8,000 electrons uh, before we see an agreement with respect to K point for the silicon system. So one thing we've done is use one year functions to essentially improve this hybrid efficiency. Um, at each step in the propagation, whenever you're calling a hybrid functional, we define a distance function which says if our um, pairs or essentially our one year function centers are a certain distance apart, say 20 AU. Um, if they're farther apart than 20 AU, don't calculate the exchange, ignore that pair. If they're within 20 AU, calculate the exchange for that pair. And for the crystalline silicon cell, we've been able to go all the way down to 15 AU or only 15% um, of pairs and still get an identical absorption spectra for that cell. Um, and this is based on work done that's been done in FEMD um, as another way to improve hybrids. And so beyond being able to do that for the 512 atom cell, we looked at this for a uh, 2000 electron cell. And in that case, we see an even more, an even larger improvement in the efficiency as at 25 AU, we only using 
7% of pairs. Um, and we're still essentially able to capture the same behavior where the relative iteration time is now um, on the order of PBE, is much closer to PBE than the typical PBE zero time. So significant cost savings. Um, and at the moment, we're looking to do the same absorption spectra for the 8,000 electron cell and then move beyond just fully crystalline silicon and use this to study properties like defects where the gamma point and the large simulation cell is key to actually understanding um, what's going on. Uh, and so just in, in summary, um, we use real-time PDEFT and the 1A function to get molecular level details and study absorption spectra of different systems. Um, and then we found that utilizing the 1A functions um, centers and using them as a pair distance function, we can significantly reduce the cost of hybrid functionals. Um, however, our implementation is limited at the moment as it's gamma point only, which is part of the reason why we have the need for this um, cost savings and these, super, these large, very large simulation cells. So in the future, we'd like to move beyond this um, gamma point only and extend it to multiple K points. Uh, thank you very much for a nice, very nice talk. Uh, any uh, questions from the audience? Yes, Jim. Yes, sir. thank you for the <laughs> This is maybe a nice question, but do you update the one your functions when you do the real time evolution, or you you just update the Hamiltonian copying parameters? Um, could you repeat that? So do you update your one your functions when you do the time evolution, or do you just update the copying parameters? We update the one year function every step we do the time evolution. Okay, any other questions? By the way, can you hear us when I speak like this? Okay. Uh, can you hear me now better? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, let's try and do this again. Uh, hello, thanks for the talk. Um, in the previous uh, slide of your topic, you showed the DNA structure in water. My question is, uh, is one year function able to simulate the hybrid event in water? Um, so for, for our solvated DNA, we only looked at it this with PDE. Or am I mishearing your question? So the question is whether you can uh, simulate the hydrogen bonding with the functional that you're using. Uh, no, not really. No, we we cannot see the hydrogen bonding with the Wanier functions. We've we only have used them to essentially separate out the contributions from water versus the DNA. Okay, um, any other questions? Yes, so I think it's maybe better to come here and use this microphone. Uh, just speak into this thing. Hi. Yes, yeah, so sorry. Do you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, concerning the time evolution of the Vanier functions, I, I understand that uh, you vanierize and then you evolve your states. So in, in doing that, the localization gauge of the Vanier functions, is it evolving under time? And if you want, a related question is, is the shape of the Vanier functions also modifying because of the different uh, block components move at a, at a different, uh, with a different energy in a different phase? So do you, do you observe, for instance, uh, a broadening of the value functions over time, or do you re-optimize? So could you comment on that? We we re-optimize the gauge at every step and um, ah, okay. take care to make sure 
Yeah, we, we take care to make sure the electric field applied is in essentially the linear response regime. So it needs to be small enough, essentially, that you don't change the character of the 1E functions um, during its application. Thanks, thanks, very nice, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's uh, thank Christopher again for his talk. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Uh,